Hello and welcome. Whatever your reason for choosing this episode, let me say I'm so glad that you're joining me in this conversation today. I really hope that you will find some value in it. I think there will be something really meaningful in this conversation because I know that there was for me. Before I get too ahead of myself, let me begin by saying I'm Abby. This is Stories Live, Stories Told, and here's what I know. We take our communication for granted. You know, it's easy to do that. We assume that somewhere along the way, we will stumble into healthy and productive ways of communicating. But we don't have to leave it all up to luck. We can consider our patterns. We can reflect on the stories that have shaped us. And really, most importantly, we can learn to make new choices about how we want to be in the world. Today, our conversation partner is Dr. Paul Porter. Paul is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the National Speech and Debate Association, or the NSDA for short. The NSDA oversees competitive speaking tournaments at the high school level. And if you've ever listened to any of my earlier episodes, you will have heard me talk about my experience with speech before. It's something I did in high school and in college as well, and it was a super meaningful activity for me. Paul is someone that I met through speech when I was in high school. We met about six years ago, and I invited him to be a guest today because, well, I see the through line of all my guests who are also completely different in terms of their perspectives on the world, the work that they do, and the stories they have to tell. They're all so different. The thing that connects them is that they're all working toward a better social world. And that better social world is always the goal. It's my goal too. It's why I do the podcast. It's why we have these conversations. Some questions I would have you keep in mind as you join us in conversation today are, how has your own childhood or home life or family relationship shaped who you are today? And also, what are the different kinds of puzzle pieces of your life and how are you trying to fit them together? So with those questions in mind, Let's begin our conversation with Paul. Hi, Paul. Thanks for being here today. Abby, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's great to talk to you, um, and, and it's good to be here. I'm really excited. I appreciate that, and I've been thinking about our intermittent meetings with each other throughout the past few years and connections, which is all revolving around the speech world. And I don't know if you remember this, but I'm just going to go ahead and start our storytelling with my most prominent memory of you, which is that my senior year of high school, when it was the state tournament, I'd won the past year. I was putting so much pressure on myself for this year. And I'm up on the stage, they're giving out the awards, and I came in fourth, which was so devastating, not first at the time, you know, now it's whatever. But you came up to me, I think you were the one to hand me my trophy, and you said to me, you still have nationals, which was just like exactly what I needed to hear in that moment, since of course the other plot line going on in my life at that time was that I'd also had nationals the year before, was looking forward to it again, and that's a time I think about a lot in my life of like, all the pressure I put on myself and just the psychology of the competition and Mm -hmm. that I felt so strongly like if I didn't do well when I came back that next year that it would like take away from my previous success that I had had which is interesting that I felt like it was so fragile so then it's funny you know to have those two years that I think about and then four more years on top of that of doing speech which adds adds a lot more layers but that's definitely my biggest memory of you I don't know if you remember that I do, actually. Uh, I also remember the second half of that sentiment, and that was after the tournament was over. And you asked me to do some peer coaching with you. And and I remember sitting in a room with you at Noblesville High School. Mm -hmm. And I remember just saying something along the lines of, I am so happy to be working with you because I've had my fill of working against you. (laughs) And that was not fun. So when you say that you remember getting fourth, uh, in in informative speaking, yep. I remember thinking, yeah, my my kid got sixth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's good perspective. Yeah. My family has given me some good language to understand myself, which is that I have a competitive spirit, as they say. And so that's I fair. definitely was driven by that. And OK, here's part two of that story. That's really funny. Mm-hmm. The person who did win first at that tournament, mm-hmm. Zev Burton. Yes. I just recorded a podcast with him. Really? We had a fascinating conversation. So that's funny, full circle moment. Were there any puns in his conversation? His whole book is about using humor in like international relationships. So he is certainly, and that's what his speech was or something was about humor. It was on puns. Yeah. So he's, he's stuck with it. 
you know it, it's the beauty of it's the beauty of our activity mm-hmm. and ironically enough the the theoretical framework that drives your podcast you know people make their own meaning and yeah you know, they get to decide what is important, what isn't, I think is the beauty and the curse right. of speech and debate is that it is subjective. Yeah. And success or failure, however you look at it from a competitive perspective, is really dependent upon how someone else makes meaning of the things that you, that you say. And mm-hmm. that can that, that can be tough. No, I, I remember coaching with you too before nationals, and that was like definitely some of the most meaningful coaching that I'd had. And so- I appreciated that. So you've been in the back of my mind, you know, since then. And yeah, now both being alumni of the Ball State speech team. Chirp, chirp, chirp. chirp. <laughs> well, okay, before we get too much into the world of speech, I've been having my guests kind of introduce themselves instead of me trying to piece together what I know of you. Sure. You obviously know your stories better and can maybe pick some to help us understand who you are considering the context of this conversation. Because obviously mm-hmm. we don't get to hear your whole life story in this next hour, uh, <laughs> but we'll do our best. But yeah, if you could share some stories, help us get to know who is Dr. Paul Porter. Wow. Who is Dr. Paul Porter? I like to think that the funniest story about me actually really does center around my arrival into the world. I was born in October of 1978. And... Nine months previously, there was a huge blizzard that hit Indianapolis, which is my hometown. And anybody, you ask anybody that's in their 50s on up about the blizzard of 78. Some Anybody in Indianapolis, you ask them about the blizzard of 78, if they were around for it, they can tell you some stories. My father worked as a stockroom manager for the city of Indianapolis. My mother was a nurse's aide very blue collar family. You know, I think back then I didn't know what middle income or or lower Uh income was. I just knew that I just knew that I didn't have everything that my friends had, but I had everything that I wanted Mm. and needed. Is that something that you think looking back or like in the moment you were able to make that distinction? I think looking back, there were moments that I felt like I had everything And then there were moments where I felt like I didn't have the things that my Mm -hmm. friends had. What I didn't have really was the capacity, you know, when you're eight, nine, 10 years old to really balance it all out. And I remember hearing my parents talk about struggles with money and thinking to myself, but I thought we were rich. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've got these brand new Jordans or I got a new video game system or I got a new TV. And I think it was really later on that I realized that I had things because my family worked, mm-hmm. my parents worked hard to provide for me. And I think it was much later when I started to read about the idea of parents wanting their children to have more than right. them. Uh, and I do believe it was, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. I think at one point, millennials were projected to be the first generation that weren't better off than than their parents. Oh. And that's when, you know, when I started to hear those types of conversations, that's when I started to realize my parents busted their butt because there were things that I mm. wanted that I couldn't have, we couldn't just easily afford. And they worked so hard to, to make a life of what you would call normalcy Mm -hmm. for for me, which I I appreciate so much. My parents had me when they were older in life. My parents had me in their 40s. I think the entirety of my childhood, up until my father passed away when I was Mm -hmm. 16, I really struggled to make sense of the fact that my parents, who were, I think they were born old souls, They weren't as attuned to the realities of the world or the sense-making process that I had of the world around me. They didn't have that. They didn't see the world the way that I did. There was never that sense of like, my parents are my friends. Hmm. It was my parents are my parents. They are my guardians. They are my caregivers. These are the two people that, and they would always remind me that they they brought me into this world. They will take care of me. They will protect and provide for me. But it's their responsibility to shape me into a human being that's going to go off 
and hopefully leave this world better, mm. not only than I found it, but than they found it. And I just didn't, you know, I wish I had taken more time to to put two and two together to really in the short time that I had with both my parents be able to to appreciate that. And, you know, that since losing my father and I've now met a point where I've been without my dad longer than I've been mm. with him. Anytime I hear conversations, uh, certainly part and parcel with the black community and the importance of 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 black male role models, the influence and the affect of the presence of a black father on a black man. I always take some time to to sit in in that literature, to sit in those conversations and almost taste the bittersweetness. Mm. It's bitter in that there are so many, unfortunately, that have not had the experience that I had having both of my parents in the house, but the sweetness of knowing that I did. And then turning that into the drive of, you know, trying to find ways to be a father figure to those that are in that unfortunate grouping of, of black men who don't, who don't know their fathers or, or are now just people that, that don't know, that don't know their fathers. And so anytime I can be a role model or be a, a source of wisdom or a source of, of care to, to today's young people is an opportunity that I'm happy to jump into. And I think that that's a real big part of why working for the National Speech and Debate Association, but also just volunteering as a speech and mm -hmm. debate coach prior to working for the NSDA has been so powerful for me. The opportunity not to have what I didn't have, mm -hmm. but rather to to pay forward what I did. So, you know, for me, trying to be a good coach, trying to be a good educator, trying to be a good colleague, trying to be a, a role model for me, it is it is definitely me attempting to pay homage to to my to my dad while also trying to to honor my mother who is who is mm -hmm. still here and is still kicking. Yeah, I, I think that's totally part of the meaning making part of this bifurcation point of. Yeah. Like you're saying, you take in all this literature, these stories that are being told, this narrative that's really frequent, that is becoming more known that this is more frequent for a lot of people in the Black community of missing out on those father figure roles and that you could kind of decide what meaning do I make out of that story? Where do I go from there? And I think it's a testament to you that you can lean into the complexity of it, of that bittersweet, not just go the direction of bitter, not just go the direction of sweet, you know, because like, you know, mm -hmm. the CMM theory, like the criticism is that it's too complicated, like people can't understand it. And so that's part of my goal is to make it more accessible. But really, it has to be so complex because life is really complex. Yeah, it is not cut and dry. If it's trying to accurately in any way make sense of life, it has to be complex. And so I really value yeah. that skill of being able to lean into the complexity of life, especially because I would say I grew up with the narratives being very black and white, right and wrong. Like there was not gray area. I was not taught. That's like a later in life thing for me that I've had to teach myself more or learn more about. Wasn't something that I grew up with that ability to lean into like harder conversations or harder experiences that are not, like you said, not cut and dry. I think it's a lot easier now than it was for for children of my generation, the kind of late Gen X, early millennial, for where we sit, for those of us in our in our early to I can't believe I say this out loud, mid forties. I think that there is for many of us, there is that growing up with kind of almost polar absolutes. Yeah. Right, wrong, fair, unfair, moral, immoral. Yeah, good, bad, right, wrong, just, unjust, mm -hmm. and and not necessarily the questioning of, well, I get why some say good, but let's think about like our definition of bad and how those two extremities kind of kind of sit and look mm -hmm. at each other and all of this big giant space in the middle. For those of us that are Gen Xers and older, I feel like that is the world that we did not get a chance mm -hmm. to have as 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 children. It was, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, yeah. ma'am. And now it's yes, gender. Is yeah, so yeah, yeah, right. Now, even so, that. You know, can you even say sir mm -hmm. or ma'am anymore? Or should you say sir or ma'am anymore? Or what is the alternative? And 
I'm a, I'm a big believer in honoring gender identity and fluency and things like fluidity and things like that. So our world is more complex for many mm-hmm. reasons. I'm thankful that today's young people get the opportunity to dig into those complexities, to talk about those complexities, to argue about those complexities, and to to dissect, to read, to research, to understand, to disagree, to to seek more. I always appreciated the the liberal arts elements of of my education, and all of those things I think are very much related to that. I agree. And I think having a mindset of like curiosity to be asking questions and learning how to ask, I won't say the right questions, because again, it's not right, wrong, good, bad, black, white like that. But asking more curious, more thoughtful questions is so important. And I think that's actually a skill that people haven't taken the time to hold in their hand and look at, really look at and pay attention to. Of course. How do you do this? The way I see it is communication is this like actually very tangible thing now that I've studied it and talked about it a lot and looked at it. But for people outside of, you know, the calm world of studying calm or talking about calm, it feels so abstract. And it's like, why do we think that we'll just figure it out along the way? We're not giving ourselves the best chance if we're not saying, well, actually there's like real tools and like language, especially for me, like language that can help you understand and express your experiences better to other people. It's just like, I just think everybody deserves to have those tools in that language because it's a real game changer in my mind. I think that it is going to be the difference between peace and war. Mm -hmm. I think it's the difference between love and hate. I think it's the difference between confrontation and and resolution. I I think it's the difference between, between calm and chaos. And that is our ability to to simply talk to Mm -hmm. each other and to understand each other. While meanwhile, in that understanding, having an awareness of who we are and who others are. I'm a big fan of the idea of something called multicultural competence, Mm -hmm. which is derivative of cultural competence, which was introduced in the late 80s in the counseling field, because at one point there were so few, and some would say this is still Mm -hmm. a reality, that there were so few psychologists and psychiatrists of color in the United Mm -hmm. States that people of color in particular had no one that looked like them or talked like them or thought like them to help them navigate mental illness which even 23 years ago, 22 years ago, when that was my persuasion in in yep. college, I remember one of the statistics we used was the reality that one-tenth of 1% of the United States psychologists and psychiatrists back then were people of color. And that statistic was juxtaposed to the reality that at one point depression was a top two killer of most people of mm. color or that something related to mental illness or mental strain was the cause, as high as the second leading cause of of, of death for many racial minorities in this country. And so one of the things I really appreciate about multicultural competence is the focus on multicultural awareness, which I like to define as an understanding of how we see ourselves and how we see others. And there's a lot to be said about the way in which my presentation of me can paint a picture and even set the mental table for how someone else sees a man of color, a black man in particular, in the United States in 2023. Am I perfect? But let's just say no. But I I do take time to think through how my actions, my words, the way I construct them, the way that I present them, and the way that I set my own uh, physical actions and behaviors, etc. Alongside those words, I do recognize that those things can create the reality of all Black men for other people. Mm. I also have to keep in mind that then you, for example, as a as a white woman, you aren't the prototype for all white women. And so for me to have the expectation that every other white woman I encounter is like Abby Van Meter, 
I run the very real risk of putting people in a position where all of the idiosyncrasies that make them them, all the nuances that make another white woman that particular person get lost and, and dashed away, and that's that's unfair. I was going to ask, how do you balance that? The word that's coming up for me is this like idea of like a tokenism of like, okay, we've heard Paul's story. Now we've heard the story of all black men in America, you know, because you're saying that you're you're aware of this, that you are representative of people that share your identity or the way, you know, other people interact with you feels like a representative. So yeah, how do you balance that getting to tell your own story, part of which happens to be the shared identity with not trying to speak for everyone, I guess. I think a big part of it is we have to take our time. I appreciate the fact that this isn't a a 10 minute conversation and that we are sitting down to engage in conversation and, and, and trying to get to know people because you can't capture 44 years in, in a couple Mm -hmm. hours. Obviously there are things that are getting left out. When we take our time to get to know people, we get to fill in some of those blanks and it's it's some of those blanks it's some of those details that that separate us out you could replace me right now with another black man and he might paint for you a completely different story and someone could hear that and think but that's not the black guy that we just heard how are they not all <sighs> the same they're both black they're both men like shouldn't they have like identical matching stories Absolutely yeah. not. People are like snowflakes. Yeah. There are they even when we look the same, we are dramatically different. But it takes time to hear the differences, to see and experience the differences, right. to mentally unpack them, to ask questions when we don't understand, to get confirmation, and then to even kind of work those things into our brain. I'm a big fan of Jean Piaget and his idea of the cognitive schema, the way that we organize images in our minds. And in my fandom of Piaget, I liken his theory to the desktop of a computer. If you go to the desktop on your computer, on your laptop, you've got all these folders with pieces of of information. You might have pictures, you might have PDFs, you might have PowerPoints, you might have Excel spreadsheets, whatever. And all of those are... If you're like me and you like to have a nice clean desktop, you separate all these things into folders and you label them. Well, the brain kind of does the exact same thing. And if you are also like me and you are too lazy to go and clean out those folders, you have all these images And sometimes you got to sift, you got to do a control F to find exactly what you're looking for to make sense of something specific. If you don't have any experiences or if you just sift right past them you don't see all of the little things i think the bigness of life comes down to the little things and you'll hear people talk about the little moments like you know where when you're when you're sitting outside with a loved one on a crisp yet still warm fall evening and you can smell the air or you can remember the sky or you can see the sunset like we remember the little things because in those moments you don't remember the other 23 and a half hours you remember those moments of serenity or you know when people talk about their wedding day or when their child is born they remember the they remember all of the little itty bitty things and there's so many of those little things that we're going to miss some stuff from time to time, but that doesn't eliminate the need for us to try and pay attention to as much as we can. Because if we just glaze over our interactions with people, if we just glaze over observations, if we just glaze over our moments and experiences, we run the very real risk of putting ourselves in the position where we cannot see the difference. And so not only is it time that we have to spend getting to know people, but also a recognition that every single individual that we meet, 
every single experience that we have, every single observation that we have, every single place that we go, every single food that we eat, a song that we listen to, all of those things are just little puzzle pieces. And if you put them all together, we get a complete or a closer to complete picture of the world. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how intricate are we willing to make our puzzle pieces so that we can see all of those little differences and grow to appreciate them? Ture, who is a media critic, newscaster, journalist, etc. He wrote a book in 2011, 2012. And in the book, I believe it is called Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness. He talks about the 40 million different ways that there are to be African-American. And what he is essentially saying in that chapter, in that section of his text, is that every African-American, every Black person in this country gets to have their own individual identity. And in that individual identity, that is one specific way to be black. There is no monolith. There is no manual for blackness. And if you are listening to this and thinking, well, I'm Korean, there is no single way to be Korean. There is no single way to be German. There is no single way to be Irish. It is literally one way. It's yours. Except my one way and someone else's one way. Now make two ways and then so on and so forth. Yeah, the theme that's emerging to me is this complexity piece, the complexity mm -hmm. of our social world, the complexity of ourselves. And you talked about the multicultural competency. Mm -hmm. The language that's coming to me is this cosmopolitan communication. You know, that's part of the CMM theory is that yeah. having the ability, which again is a skill, like a practice skill to mm -hmm. know what is true for yourself, and exist and be comfortable in the tension between somebody else's experience that does not both for both to be true at the same time for all to be true at the same time you know like you Absolutely. said 40 million different ways how mm -hmm. many people are on the earth that's how many different tensions you're gonna have to yeah. learn to lean into and again i think there's so much value in that like i think it's a huge disservice to oversimplify people to oversimplify anything in the world you're saying, how small are you willing to get those puzzle pieces? And that's a great metaphor. It's really resonating with me because I actually love to do puzzles. But I'm picturing those that you would do when you were like a child and there's like nine pieces and they're like three inches tall, each of the pieces. Yeah. And then now I'm like, okay, 500 piece puzzle, 1000 piece puzzle. And it's like, they get smaller. When I do different puzzles, you almost have a different strategy for how you go about the puzzle. And so it is like the questioning process. Like I say it's skills, I say there's tools. But there's not a copy paste method to use right. for creating the kind of social world you want, creating the relationships that you want. It's every moment of every day, pick up a puzzle piece and figure out what to do with it. And it looks different every time. And you end up with different answers every time. You end up with more questions. Absolutely. More puzzle pieces to fit together. That's just my perspective. But what's you know becoming clear to me, I think, is probably what I picked up on a long time ago before I even had the language to say it is that what we share is a communication perspective is that yes. for me, that's the lens that yeah. I see my whole life through. And there's, you know, sometimes I take those glasses off and probably put other ones on, but that's definitely the dominant lens. Well, let me throw one more thing on your, on your puzzle metaphor, please. Cause as I was listening to you, I thought, Oh, let me, let me throw this curveball at you. In the puzzle that is life. There's no box cover. Mm -hmm. I can't flip the box over mm -hmm. and look at the finished product because there is no finished product. And long after we're gone, the puzzle continues to, to reform and to reshape itself. And that is actually a, a somewhat perfect example, a pretty decent example of something that we call cultural humility. Mm. which is a theory that was written by a couple of pediatricians back in the late 90s. And cultural humility is this idea that suggests that 
because the world evolves socially, as we learn more, the world is still moving. And by that, I mean that we are socially evolving. Uh -huh. So if I, for example, got interested in race relations in the United States five years ago, and I read everything about the Black African American diaspora, including every single book, article, documentary, podcast, etc., about race relations in the United States and the Black community's relationship with law enforcement. If I read every single word, every single page, every single minute of every single video, I watched absolutely everything and I rolled through 2020. Now I've got it. I understand. Oh, what do you mean, George Floyd? Yeah. By the time you've read everything there is to read, there'll be a mil more million stuff more to things read. to read. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you're right. The puzzle I metaphor falls apart a little bit here, but if I'm going to run with it, it's like, yeah, having no edge pieces, which is always where yeah. you start with a puzzle. You want to frame it. And we find ways to do that. But you're right. It's like somebody coming and dumping 500 more pieces on the puzzle, just as you think you're putting the last piece in there. It's a never ending puzzle. So I know we've already touched on Ball State and speech a little bit, but I'd love to hear about how you first got into the world of communication and also why you stayed, you know, like why it sticks with you. Mm, why I stayed that that is that's the real kicker. That's the kicker. The Paul Porter communication story. It really should be brought to you in part by so many people. Mm hmm. So I remember third or fourth grade taking one of those, we called them the bubble tests because yep. you were always filling in a scantron with bubbles and it was some proficiency test. And I just remember getting the scores back and it measured us on things like, you know, math, reading comprehension, writing. There was a category, I think it was called written communication. Now I had scored in the 80s on everything but then the written communication line just kept going and it went all the way to 99 and i just remember my parents were explaining it to me and when they explained it to me i got all big eyed and i'm like i speak better than every third grader in the country and they just kind of looked at me and they're like yeah whatever who knew fast forward a few years a lot of my experience with communication has been by luck and happenstance. I remember being in the ninth grade, and this story is going to tie so many things together. I am on the football team. I'm a wrestler. I guess you could say I'm a good student. I'm, a, I'm an okay guy at that, at that point. I'm good people. I walk into homeroom on the first day of ninth grade. I went to a junior high, by the way. So uh, for me... I went to a school for 7th, 8th, and ninth grade before going to high school. I didn't mm. actually start high school until the 10th grade. I don't know if junior highs still exist anymore. So I walk in, walk into school, first day in ninth grade, and I go to homeroom. My homeroom is in the choir room. I only knew it was the choir room because the year before I took my music requirement and that was a course called general music. I didn't want to learn how to play an instrument. Didn't think we could afford an instrument. I don't like to admit that I can sing, but I, I got a couple pipes. And so I walk in and the homeroom that I'm in I don't know how I fell into it. I still, to this day, do not know how I ended up in this room, but it was actually the homeroom for all the members of our honors choir. We called it swing choir. Mm -hmm. No idea how I got in there. <laughs> not something you signed up for. Did not sign up for it because the idea of, and this is back in like the mid nineties. Right. So the idea that like the starting left tackle on the football team and the varsity heavyweight wrestler is actually a heck of a baritone. Yeah. That just, you know, we were so wrapped up in just, you know, those yep. silly gendered roles. Yeah. That the idea that, you know, the big bad football player is in choir, like, you know, it's going to ruin my reputation. Well, again, it's an oversimplified 
label. Yes. And I think like labels can be good. And I actually just talked to someone else. We had a huge conversation about labels on the podcast and that'll come out soon. But the label, that language, I think can be helpful for people. But if you just mm. let it stand on its own, then it's oversimplification. So what's the label? And then it's again, asking the questions, well, what does that mean to you? Right. And what meaning exactly. do you attach to it? Why can't the you know person on the football team and the person that's a wrestler also be in choir? What's the meaning that we're attaching that right. makes those things mutually exclusive and here's the scary thing about these superficial simplifications remember i was in the ninth grade I was 14 and these thoughts were deeply embedded yeah. and i bet you abby i bet you that if you could somehow take like a mental saw and cut my skull open and go deep into my brain somewhere they're still there yeah which is the really super hard part about living in a diverse world mm -hmm. is that you know when you're 44 am i 44 yeah when you're 44 there are things from 30 years ago that are back here somewhere yeah that can creep up front if you're not careful mm. and so we constantly have to be in thought to make sure that some of the not so great images and thoughts and perspectives in our mind don't creep up and take over so the interesting thing about my homeroom was that it had two extracurricular activities attached to it. One was the honors choir. Two was this thing called WFJH, W. Fulton Jr. High. And it was the morning announcements. We had a camera. I remember, it's like 1993. Yeah. We have a camera on a tripod. And somebody has created this news desk. And so we really think that we are like Barbara Walters and freaking, I, I thought I was, you know, Walter Cronkite. We really thought we were doing something. Yeah, and yeah. it was actually almost like this home video that we would then record the morning announcements. Somebody would take the tape to the principal's office, put it up on a screen. And I hadn't gotten to do it yet. I hadn't gotten to do the the news yet. And so when it was finally my turn and I was asked what I wanted to do, I said, I want to do sports because, you know, I'm an athlete. I love sports. Yep. And so I start doing it and I put so much personality into reading a good luck message to the girls volleyball team. I walk out of homeroom. And everyone at school is like, go get them, girls. Because at one point, that was like something that I said. So it becomes this thing. Teachers are talking about it. Mm. Students are talking about it. I was invited to the girls' volleyball game that night just to like lead people in this cheer of mm -hmm. go get them, girls. It became <laughs> this thing. And, and you know this just like I do. When you go to a big high school, mm -hmm. it's easy in those big giant spaces to get lost and much like your high school my school district everybody was good at something mm -hmm. and so I had finally found like my thing I could be good at also because I thought we put the whole singing thing away I auditioned for the honors choir just as a joke literally mm -hmm. as a joke I go into this back room with our choir director and I just sing the eight bars do re mi fa so la ti do and he stops and he looks at me and i thought we were gonna like laugh at it and make a big thing and he's like oh wait you can sing and like that became like this evolving thing that i worked through all the way through high school hmm. doing the morning announcements in the ninth grade got me thinking about my future and when I saw the attention and the excitement that literally a 14 year old saying, go get them girls. When I saw what that created, I started to really work at it. Yeah. I, st I went home. I, I was a news watcher when I was a kid. I remember being as, as early as like first or second grade, Abby, when I was in elementary school as a latchkey kid, my mom worked at night. My dad would go get my mom and pick her up from work. And so I was basically in charge of getting up in the morning, getting myself dressed, grabbing my lunch money off of the, the dining room table, going to the bus. As young as like six, seven years old, I would watch the local news. And so when I got this opportunity to do these morning announcements, 
I drew back to the morning news. But instead of now just watching it for the sake of, of watching it, I can't, by the way, listen to the Iran-Contra affair the same way because I'm like, I remember being like eight years old and like watching it. I would like go to school. I would like go to school and be like, so what do you think about this Iran-Contra affair? And like my second, third grade teacher's are like, uh, are you talking about <laughs> So now I'm like, I'm in like the, you know, ninth grade. I'm like watching the news and I'm taking notes mm -hmm. and I'm learning about like transitions. I'm learning about how to like, how to move like tone and pacing from one story to another. And I remember one day I got to do the, I was the main newscaster and I'm sitting next to the sports guy and I'm literally like doing my stories and stuff like that. And I get to a point where I'm like, hey, and Steve, hey, man, in sports is a tough game for the Falcons last night, huh? And everyone in the room's like, what? And they asked me, like, where did that come from? And I said, man, I was watching the morning news. That, like, <laughs> they do that because that's what they do. Yeah. My high school had a radio station. Hmm. Shameless plug, 90.9 WBDG, Indianapolis. And I, I took the mass media course and I got onto the radio staff. And from there, it was just, you know, we're off to the races. It was something that I absolutely loved, really enjoyed. Had an after school show on, on Friday afternoons. Uh, I got to do commentary and play by play for basketball games, things like that. And I will never forget my junior year on a Saturday. I come in to do a Saturday afternoon radio show. Usually it's it's difficult to get into my high school because it's a big high school. And so I walk into my high school, lights are on, there's a lot of hustle and bustle, and there are a lot of people in suits and dress clothes, and a bunch of them are talking to walls. Could not understand why. I run into a buddy of mine. His name's Eddie Conkle. I run into him and I ask him what's going on. He's like, oh, man, it's a speech tournament. I'm like, wait a minute, what? He's like, yeah, man, it's a speech team. You know, I was talking to you about speech team a while ago. And I'm like, yeah, man, I thought that was, I thought you were just a dork. And when he explained it to me, I thought, oh, this is cool. But seeing it, seeing all that life, seeing all that energy, seeing all that fun, was attractive to to me my mm -hmm. senior year you know when i'm done playing football and i come to the realization that you know i'm not gonna play football in college i remember i go to my i go to our speech coach this guy named max mcqueen legendary high school speech and debate coach in indiana hall of fame coach i, I go to him and i say max i don't know what speech team is but i'm gonna be on it he thought I was just, you know, pulling his chain. I bugged him all summer because I went to summer school every summer. Mm. And I kept saying, hey, can I like, can I do some practicing or something like that? And he's like, yeah, yeah whatever. He, I don't think he, uh, he did not think I was serious. First day of my senior year of high school, I go to him and I walk in and I sit down in his office, sit down in his classroom rather. And he says, what do you need, Paul? And I said, I would like to be on the speech team. May I please join the speech team? And he just looks at me and says, oh, you were serious. Okay, we are going to pause our conversation with Paul here, and we'll pick back up with part two of this conversation on Monday, so be sure to stay on the lookout for that. And in the meantime, let this conversation stick with you, you know, see what comes up as you continue to reflect. This conversation, like any conversation we have in our lives, really doesn't necessarily end when we stop talking. The stories stay with us, and I hope some of these stories will stick with you this week, too. And I hope you'll come back for more next week. As always, I get to do this podcast with support from the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. They are undoubtedly the greatest people that I have ever had the pleasure of working with. Individually and together, they're absolutely on that path to creating a better social world. I'm so honored to be a part of it, and I just want to keep inviting you to be a part of all of the work that they do, too. You can read more about them on my website or theirs, both of which I'll link below. Finally, I have a couple next turns for you that I hope will really help this Stories Lived, Stories Told community to keep growing. One, please follow the show wherever you listen and leave a review if you can. Two, share an episode you love with someone who you want to invite into the conversation. And three, connect with me on Instagram, YouTube, or on the Stories Live Stories Told website. I love to be in conversation with you as much as possible. 
So thank you for taking the time to do one or all of these, and thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious, and thank you for being a part of this story. Keep creating mindful moments, and until next time, I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. Mm-hmm.